just can't do it around. Sure. Is this around my neck? Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this event. Uh, I think this is a wonderful initiative on uh, the part of the computer science department here. <clears throat> and uh, uh, as I last told you, I, I must apologize uh, for being the odd man out here. Um, uh, <laughs> my talk will essentially have nothing to do with computer science, but I hope it will be entertaining, you know. People get their entertainment in the morning by doing crossword puzzles, uh, drinking five cups of coffee or tea. Uh, for a change, uh, we'll try some mathematics. Today. So, so I hope. Uh, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> so the the. Uh, the topic of my talk today will be to tell you something about uh, polynomials and uh, there is an interesting duality that one can associate to polynomials. Now polynomials are something that you have been studying since class 8 maybe perhaps or even 7, I, I don't know. Uh, and you have spent a good deal of your time uh, solving quadratic equations and uh, doing all sorts of uh, various calculations with them. So, so I'm going to start with quadratic equations. <clears throat> um, can everybody back there read my writing? And of course, I must say, please uh, feel free to interrupt me if something is not clear. <coughs> so let us start with uh, <clears throat> a quadratic. And I'm assuming that uh, the leading coefficient uh, is 1. I can always do that without loss of generality. And the question, of course, is to find the roots of, of such a polynomial. Now, I don't have to tell you, uh, you all know what to do in this case. There's a well-known well formula which is thousands of years old. And if you look at history books, you will find many, many interesting accounts of how this was arrived at in the first place. But what I want to do is to <clears throat> illustrate a slightly different viewpoint about arriving at the roots here. All right. The general philosophy is the following. So if you have a quadratic equation <clears throat> of this form, and supposing that b was equal to 0, that means you didn't have a linear term, then your quadratic would simply be x squared plus c, in which case there is no difficulty in solving this the roots are simply the square root of uh, plus minus c. Yeah. So this is the approach that I am going to emphasize today. Um, let us try to eliminate the linear term in this case. <coughs> so try to eliminate. Um, <coughs> involving x. <coughs> All right, and uh, the way I'll do this is by introducing a transformation. <clears throat> so I will write y as x plus some alpha, where alpha is something that we will determine. And uh, <clears throat> if y is x plus alpha, then I will write x equal to y minus alpha in this equation to transform this. So let's call this equation one. So one becomes the following expression in y. <clears throat> so this becomes y minus alpha squared plus b times y minus alpha plus c. <clears throat> so I will expand this. So this is y squared minus 2 alpha y plus alpha squared plus b y minus b alpha plus c. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. <clears throat> Let us collect the terms involving y. 
and not worry about the remaining terms. So this becomes y and the coefficient is minus 2 alpha plus b. <coughs> now please remember alpha was at my disposal. So I am going to choose alpha in such a way that minus 2 alpha plus b is 0. <coughs> so choose alpha equals b by 2. So with this choice of alpha, I have ensured that equation 1 is of the form y squared, this term no longer exists. And let's see what happens to the remaining terms here. So I have alpha squared minus p alpha plus c. <coughs> I know what alpha is. So this is b squared by 4. I substitute this here. I get b squared by 2 plus c. <coughs> and this becomes um, y squared minus b squared by 4 plus c. So this is exactly of the form a quadratic term and a constant. For this, uh, we don't have to sweat this out. So this is b squared by 4 minus c. And therein you will recognize the well-known quadratic formula here. Right? So you take the square root of b squared by 4 minus c and you get the value of y but then y is x plus alpha. I know what alpha is, that's b by 2, and therefore I know what x is. x is <coughs> plus or minus the square root of b squared by 4 minus c, and then alpha is minus b by 2. You will all recognize this as the standard quadratic form. <coughs> so what was the philosophy? Given a degree 2 term, you eliminate the linear part. Let us see if we can do this for higher order equations. <coughs> for cubics. <coughs> okay. So I am going to assume that the cubic has this form, x cubed plus x squared plus bx plus c. And uh, <clears throat> I want to eliminate this term here. And you know, why do I stop only at x squared? Maybe I can do something interesting, something nifty to eliminate d also. If I can do that, then I'm in very good shape. This will become x cubed plus c equal to 0 or a different c perhaps. Okay. But first step, let's try to eliminate the quadratic term. So. <clears throat> Again, let's try a substitution, y equals x plus alpha. <coughs> and before I show you that calculation there, uh, I want to draw your attention to what this transformation is really doing. If you write y as x plus alpha, x plus alpha is simply a translation of the coordinate system. You are shifting your axis by a certain amount. So a general parabola, a general degree 2 polynomial will be either of this form or of that form. right? I am translating my y-axis to make this graph symmetric about it. That's exactly what I am doing. So that's the geometry that one should keep in mind. I am trying to do the same thing for cubics. But cubics are, um, cubics are much more richer. Um, it's not very clear what symmetrizing them would really mean, but we'll see. <coughs> All right, so I'll write x as y minus alpha and plug this in here, y minus alpha cubed, uh, y minus alpha squared a plus b, y minus alpha plus c. <coughs> So I will spare you the trouble. I, I scribbled these la late last night. I hope I haven't made a mistake here. All right. So I have a degree 3 term coming from here. Uh, let's collect the y squared terms. 
y squared will have a coefficient of minus 3 alpha plus a and the square term will come from here and it's going to come from here no other terms are going to contribute y squared okay? and then there will be a bunch of other terms let's not worry about them <coughs> so <coughs> i want to eliminate the degree 2 term which means i must equate this equal to 0 <coughs> if i do that i get alpha equals a by 3 <coughs> a by 3 <coughs> And uh, with this choice of alpha, I would write here, <coughs> you get the following equation. You get y cubed, it's coming from here. You'll have a linear term, which I will write as p times y. You can compute what p is in terms of a, b, c. That's irrelevant. And then a constant term, q, equal to 0. <coughs> <coughs> Now, what is the geometry behind choosing alpha equals a by 3, apart from the algebraic convenience that we have? What is a in this case? <clears throat> a is the coefficient of the square term. And if you remember stuff from a long time ago, minus a is simply the sum of the roots of the cubic. You remember that? Very good. <clears throat> so you are taking the sum of the roots and you are dividing that by 3 you are actually averaging out the roots and you are translating the coordinates in such a way that your y axis now passes through the average of the three roots. So this is in some sense a symmetrization procedure. Okay, <clears throat> okay so if uh, <clears throat> I have been able to do this, the next question from everybody here should be, uh, what next? Can I eliminate y, for example? <clears throat> Can I eliminate y? <clears throat> so if you try some simple-minded substitutions like this, you can write z equals y plus beta. Try to do that. Um, it doesn't work. You may end up eliminating the linear term, but the quadratic term will reappear. So that is no simple minded procedure to to ensure that <clears throat> the quadratic term disappears and stays so and at the same time you take care of the linear term also not possible <clears throat> in general i'm saying in general <clears throat> so this is the best that we can do <clears throat> uh, this is sometimes called the reduced cubic reduced because one term is missing All right, so this is where we stand and now the, <clears throat> the story becomes very, very interesting both mathematically and historically. <clears throat> Before I get to the history part, I will tell you what to do with the reduced cubic. Let me finish this discussion and then we'll end up with some interesting tidbits of history. So solving the reduced cubic. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> if you open any standard book on I don't know, uh, some algebra, <clears throat> you will actually find a formula for the solution here. Q. Um, so what I want to do is to emphasize um, <clears throat> some of the salient features of where this formula is coming from. Uh, it is not as simple as the quadratic, but it is rich enough to deserve its, its own study. And of course, once we are done with cubics, uh, your natural question should be what happens to degree 4 polynomials, what happens to degree 5 polynomials and so on. All right. So this was the, I would say, the, the mainstay of, 
of mathematics a long time ago. Um, and it's, you know, tracing back the history, I think, is, is uh, it's a very interesting thing. <clears throat> So I'll tell you something which uh, um, a gentleman named Vieta did. <clears throat> so this is uh, from 1591. So I'll sketch his main idea. <clears throat> so it's a very charming trick. <coughs> so I have y cube plus py plus q equal to 0. <clears throat> So Vieta said, um, let me not try any of these simple-minded translations, x plus alpha and so on, try something interesting. He said, let's write y equals z minus p by 3z. <clears throat> if you ask me where this came from, the answer will be clear in the next 30 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> And by the way, uh, just one other remark. If p happens to be 0, there is nothing to be done. I already know the roots to be needed in that case. <clears throat> All right. So let's try y equals z minus p by 3z. z is some another unknown. Let's plug this in here. So I get z minus p by 3z cubed <clears throat> plus p times z minus 3 by 3z plus q. To zero. <coughs> Maybe I should write here. <coughs> Let's simplify this. <coughs> so I'll start with the first term. So I get z cubed minus 3z squared p by 3z plus 3 times z p squared by 9 z squared and then I have minus p cubed by 27 z cubed. Yeah, please correct me if I make a mistake. <clears throat> That's the first term. The second term is p z minus p squared by 3 z plus q equal to 0. <clears throat> is this okay? Um, <clears throat> please take a look. These two go away. <clears throat> and uh, so do these two terms. Is <clears throat> z cubed minus p cubed by 27 z cubed plus q equal to 0. Can we handle this? Uh, we can certainly handle this because I will write this as z to the 6 <clears throat> plus q z cubed minus p cubed by 27 equal to 0. Equation <clears throat> takes a cubic and gives you a degree 6 equation of a very, very special kind. This is a quadratic in z cubed. This will allow us to find what z is and I know what y is and therefore I know what x is. But the surprising thing is that there is a fair bit of work to be to be done here. I will tell you why. <coughs> so let us write down the roots first. So z cubed by the quadratic formula will be <coughs> minus q by 2 uh, plus or minus the square root of q by 2 squared 
plus uh, 4 p cube by 27 <coughs> divided by divided by 2. <coughs> oh, oh I, we don't need this by 2 here. I don't need this 4 here also. The, the 2 has been put here. So, so this is that cube. I'll just write this as square root of r, where r is this. So r is q by 2 squared plus p by 3 cubed. <coughs> This is that cube. <clears throat> so Um, see, I'll try to give you two answers which which seem plausible because I haven't seen an explanation for this in Vieta's writings at all. <clears throat> uh, answer number one is that if, if you go back to school trigonometry. Um, you would have learned uh, that uh, sine of n theta and cosine of n theta, these are polynomials in sine theta and cosine theta. You remember that? Just by complex numbers. In particular, if you look back at cosine 3 theta and sine of 3 theta, they can be written as cubics in sine and cosine. I will say no more. I will request you to go back to, to, to these formulae here, stare at them for 30 seconds. Something. Answer that I can give you. Which here was an algebraic version of this observation. And the second answer, uh, this may look very, very frivolous in 2017, but people were, were not afraid of computing. They were not afraid of rolling up their sleeves of calculations. Many of them inspired, some of them not, but that's, that's how the age was. Uh, becoming very rare traits these days. Given the development of mathematics and, and so on in the last, you know, so many centuries, one can try to give more complicated, more sophisticated reasons for this choice. I don't want to get into that. <coughs> All right, so now uh, you will tell me that, look, we are done. Uh, so what is the problem? Um, the problem is rather interesting. You see, I have to first take the cube root of this quantity here. Um, this could be negative. I, I don't know. This could be negative. Choices, a plus and a minus, square root of r. So for the plus sign, I have to take a cube root, and for the negative sign, I have to take another cube root. Yeah. So I have three possibilities here, three possibilities here. And then uh, to find the value of y, I'm not sure which of these cube roots to take.
How many cube roots are there of one? There are three. One omega omega squared. Right? So which one do I put here? And likewise, I'm not sure which one do I put here. Three possibilities, three possibilities. There has to be a way out because a priori I seem to get nine solutions. And this is just a cubic equation. <clears throat> the problem. How do I decide the, the cube roots? <coughs> so what Vieta did was uh, something nice. <coughs> he made the following observation. Uh, <clears throat> now just because there are two possibilities, I will write A cubed for the positive sign and B cubed for the negative sign. Different things. <coughs> so, um, um, <coughs> let's multiply these out. Let's see what you get. If you multiply these out, uh, you're going to get uh, u squared by 4 minus r, but I know what r is r is u by 2 squared minus p by 3 cubed. All right? So this is exactly minus p cubed by 27. <coughs> <Okay>. <coughs> so if I take the cube root of both sides, <coughs> a, b, whatever a and b are, this is going to be of the form minus p by 3 minus p by 3 omega, omega being the cube root of unity, or it will be minus p by 3 omega square. These are the three possibilities for A. <coughs> so, in order to know what the solution is, in order to know what the solution is, um, I need to plug in the various values of z here, right? <clears throat> but this calculation tells me that uh, with this notation, a equals this and b equals this, the product is one of these three possibilities. <clears throat> in other words, b, suppose I choose a, b equals minus b by 3. Suppose this is one case that I have to consider. B, B will be minus P by 3 divided by A. Right? And if you notice, minus P by 3 is exactly the same coefficient here. So if I write Z as A, this is of the form minus P by 3A. By 3A is exactly equal to B. These for Y can be actually listed down. Y is exactly A plus B, A plus B, where I have chosen AB to be minus P by 3. <coughs> but then the problem is, well, there are three possibilities for A and there are three possibilities for B, just by taking cube roots. Which of the three cube roots do I choose? You see, I've already made the choice e to be minus p by 3, to write it that way. That determines my fate. <clears throat> a times omega, as said, then the choice of the other term will have to be b times omega squared, because the product has to be minus p by 3. I cannot take b omega. I will be in trouble. <clears throat> Possibility is this. Choice. The product has to be minus p by 3. So this rules out combinations like 
a plus b omega not allowed a omega plus b and so on and so forth so as i told you there are three choices for this term three choices for this term a priori i seem to get nine possibilities but out of those nine six do not work these are the three that work <clears throat> so we had concluded being a degree three polynomial i have found all the three roots <coughs> so i must end this by clarifying one thing so here a and b are chosen so that the product is minus p by p yeah <coughs> you might ask me you know why am i being partial to the first term why don't i choose the product to be minus p by 3 omega okay no problem if i do that then i'm going to mess things up here addition is going to work <clears throat> all right so this is this is the solution of uh, of the cubic dating back to 1591 so we actually have a formula in terms of p and q and hence in terms of a b and c a solution by radicals in in quadratics uh, you study something called the discriminant right b squared minus 4ac you remember where that is coming from um if you take a quadratic say x squared plus bx plus c and if you let alpha and beta be the roots then alpha plus beta is minus b and alpha beta is c right so what is the discriminant this is b squared minus 4c in other words this is alpha plus beta squared minus 4 times the product ab this this is exactly alpha minus beta squared squared and is to be understood as the square of the difference of the two roots of the quadratic why do you square this in the first place the answer is very simple if you look at alpha plus beta or for that matter alpha beta look at these two functions the sum and the product these are what are called symmetric functions symmetric because you see alpha and beta are simply names i don't know which one to call alpha which one to call beta beta is symmetric under the labeling alpha and beta likewise the product is invariant under the labeling alpha and beta it doesn't matter which one i call alpha which one i call beta but when i look at differences alpha minus beta is not the same as beta minus alpha the tax and the tax is minus 1 not in any mood of paying taxes so we might as well square everything alpha minus beta squared and this object then becomes invariant under labelings alpha and beta the discriminant this way i am going to define <coughs> a discriminant for the cubic now <coughs> discriminant is the discriminant of the reduced cubic <clears throat> so um, let r1 r2 r3 be the roots here this is r1 r2 r3 <clears throat> so i'll define the discriminant to be r1 minus r2 r2 minus r3 r3 minus r1 so pair wise differences but this is not symmetric under cyclic permutations of the indices 1 2 3 so i will square them 
This is my discriminant, which I will call delta. <coughs> so let's try to compute this. So what is R1 minus R2? <coughs> so R1 minus R2, this will be A1 minus omega. By the way, is this visible back there? Okay, right here. Plus B1 minus omega squared. <coughs> so I can write this as <coughs> 1 minus omega A plus B1 plus omega. I of course know that 1 plus omega plus omega squared is 0, so I will use that here. 1 plus omega I will write as minus omega squared. This is 1 minus omega A minus B omega squared. This is R1 minus R2. <coughs> minus R3, Let's look, take a look at that. <coughs> So I have A omega 1 minus omega um, minus B omega 1 minus omega. <clears throat> All right, so this is omega 1 minus omega A minus B. And then let's try to find out R3 minus R1. R3 minus R1 is, let's take a look, A omega squared minus 1 plus B omega minus 1. <clears throat> so this is uh, omega minus 1, A 1 plus omega, 1 plus omega is minus omega squared plus B. <clears throat> And uh, just to sort of make this look like the other two, I'm going to factor out minus omega squared. I'll write this as minus omega squared, omega minus 1, A minus B, divided by omega squared. But 1 over, one over omega squared is omega. <clears throat> so these are the uh, pairwise differences. So let's try to compute what the <coughs> discriminant is. <coughs> so delta is the square of all these guys. So let's take a look. <coughs> so I have omega minus 1, 1 minus omega, 1 minus omega. <coughs> so this is uh, 1 minus omega cubed. Well, I have to square this, right? I forgot to square. <coughs> uh, let's take a look. So, this is minus 1, 1 minus omega <coughs> squared and then cubed. A minus B. A minus B omega, A minus B omega square. Whole thing is square. Right? <clears throat> now take a look at this. This is A minus B, A minus B omega, A minus B omega square. Uh, if you multiply this out, get exactly a cube minus b cube. <clears throat> and then there is uh, some stuff here. Um, you can compute this as well. <clears throat> I'll just write down the final thing. <clears throat> uh, minus 3 root 3 i <clears throat> times a cube minus b cube. <clears throat> so a little bit of calculation. Um, 
I know what A and B are, right? So A was <coughs> minus Q by 2 plus square root of R, B was minus Q by 2 minus square root of R. These were the cube roots of these quantities. Uh, sorry, A cube and B cube for this. So when I subtract these two, this term is exactly 2 times the square root of R. <coughs> and then when I simplify this, you get something very, very nice. So the discriminant <coughs> turns out to be <coughs> minus 108 R. <coughs> or written slightly differently, <coughs> this is minus 4 P cubed plus 27Q squared. <clears throat> so this is the analog for the discriminant in the case of cubics. Sort of like B squared minus 4AC. Right? And now from this definition of the discriminant, we can read off certain properties of the nature of the roots. See, going back to the quadratic case, you know that if your discriminant is positive, then you have real distinct roots. If the discriminant is zero, you have real equal roots. And if, they, if that number is negative, you have complex conjugates, right? Now, what happens in the case of a cubic equation? Go back to calculus. If you use the intermediate value theorem, you know that there has to be at least one real root because if you go to plus infinity, the graph is either this way or this way. So it has to cut the x-axis somewhere. There exists at least one root. What are the possibilities for the remaining two? Well, they could either be real or they could be complex conjugates. They have to be conjugates because the coefficients are real. So these are the only possibilities, right? So I'll just write down the the summary of this based on this observation. <coughs> so, observation. First one is <coughs> that if delta is positive, uh, this happens precisely when the cubic has three distinct real roots, delta equal to 0, precisely when <coughs> there are multiple roots, repeated roots, and all are real. Not very difficult to see this. Yeah? And finally, if delta is less than 0, precisely when there is one real root, this is from calculus, not a surprise, and two complex conjugates, two complex conjugates. <clears throat> so looking at the discriminant will tell you the nature of the roots. <clears throat> You can actually carry this discussion forward even for degree 4 polynomials. The first step is to eliminate the cubic term. Um, but then uh, arriving at an analog of V8A's trick is, is not that simple. But it can be done. Uh, it can be done. So there is a formula by radicals. But what is interesting is the analog of the discriminant there. So for a degree 4 polynomial, you will have four possibilities for the roots, R1, R2, R3, R4. And how are you going to create the discriminant in that case? You will have to look at all possible differences. How many are there? 4C2. Exactly. <clears throat> And uh, since this is a symmetric polynomial, symmetric polynomial, uh, there is uh, 
a fundamental theorem which says that any symmetric polynomial can be expressed in terms of the elementary symmetric polynomials. Elementary meaning sum, product, sum taken two at a time, sum taken three at a time. And all of these are related to the coefficients of the given equation. If you take a degree 4 equation, you know what the sum of the roots is, you know what the product is, you know what the sum is taken two at a time and so on. So in principle, you can write down a formula for the discriminant of a degree 4 polynomial. In fact, for any degree, this will work. But then one has to work harder to get an analog of this statement. How does the sign of the discriminant tell you the nature of the roots? Uh, and as the degree increases, the possibilities also increase. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> uh, think of the roots as an abstract collection. We don't know what they are. Yeah, we are trying to understand something about the roots. What do we know? We know the sum of all the elements. I know the product of all the elements. I know the sum taken two at a time. Right? I have this information. But I don't know what each individual element is. Natural questions to ask is, are roots repeated? If so, how many times? Are they all distinct? Are they occurring in complex conjugates? Things like that. So the discriminant is a measure of the nature of the roots. See, if I take R1 minus R2, and if R1 happens to be equal to R2, then delta is 0, right? So this is a measure, this is, this is a technique for measuring when you have repeated roots. So, so there are reasons like this why this is the right object to consider. <coughs> All right. So, um, <coughs> so having told you this, uh, I want to shift to some <coughs> a little bit of geometry here uh, and tell you why these are very very natural objects. You know, just like b squared minus 4ac, you should all digest this in every cell of yours from today onwards. 4p cubed plus 27q squared and don't forget to put a minus sign. Yeah? Knowing the sign of this will tell you the nature of the roots of any cubic equation. <coughs> all right. So let me change tracks uh, just a little bit. <coughs> So to motivate uh, the last 10 minutes or so, <clears throat> I will go back to the case of quadratics. <coughs> and I will consider a quadratic of this kind. I'm writing P and Q because I want to make connection with the cubic case. Now, all along, we have been conditioned to think of this as an equation in the unknown x, given p and q. But I will request your attention to reverse this viewpoint now. In other words, fix an x. And then think of this as an equation in the unknowns P and Q. What do you get? X is fixed now. This is a straight line. Where? In the PQ plane. So I will write this as Q equals minus PX 
minus x squared. So if I draw the PQ axis, say P here and Q here, vertical. <coughs> This is a straight line with slope equal to minus x and the q intercept is minus x squared, right? Look at the q intercept, it is always minus x squared, no matter what x is. So the y, the q intercept is always going to be below the, the p axis here. The slope can change depending on the sign of x. Let us do that. Let us try to sketch some of these lines. So if I take uh, <clears throat> x to be minus 1, say, then I get uh, q equals p minus 1. That is a straight line with slope 1 and intercept minus 1. <clears throat> if I take x to be minus 1, Oh, sorry, <coughs> plus 1. This is q equals minus p minus 1. This is the line that you get. <coughs> right. What happens if you take minus 2? Take x to be plus minus 2 rather. <coughs> then the slopes are going to increase. And you get a picture like this. And if you happen to move closer to the origin, <coughs> and if you choose x to be 0, then I get q equal to 0, <coughs> is this line. So I get this family of lines. And I will request to the inherent artist in all of you to try and trace out a curve which is tangent to each of the lines that I have drawn here. Think of a curve which is tangent to each of the lines that you see on the board. The yellow ones, the green ones, the white one. So on. What kind of a curve do you envisage? Arbor. <laughs> something like this let us call this C I do not know what C is but this is what I can draw what I can draw right now the entire PQ plane is divided into three sets set number one is all the PQ points that lie below this curve Set number 2 is all the points that lie above this curve here. And the third set is all the points that lie on C. Yeah? Now these three sets have very interesting properties. Pick a point that lies below C. It's somewhere here. <coughs> yeah? Keep drawing more and more of these lines. If you draw enough lines, you will find that the cross that I have marked there will lie on two such lines. In other words, from this point I can draw two tangents to C. Two tangents to C. And if you think about this reversal of roles, the x coordinate of the point of contact will give you the two roots of the quadratic corresponding to this point p comma q so given an arbitrary p comma q in that sector you can draw two tangent lines to the purple curve the x coordinate of the points of contact will be the roots of that quadratic so this is actually a machine to read off the roots given p and q <clears throat> take a point that lies above c tangent to C. It needs proof, but you can't draw a tangent. <clears throat> a 
and if you happen to be on C, that's exactly one tangent. If you are on C, use the definition of C. C is a curve which is tangent to each line precisely at one point. So there is a unique tangent that you can draw. This is a case of repeated roots. <coughs> repeated roots. <coughs> so how do I find the equation of C? <coughs> so C, <coughs> that means that this must have repeated roots. <coughs> repeated roots occur precisely when the polynomial and its derivative share a root. Think about it. <coughs> so these two equations share a common root, which means that I can eliminate x from these two. Put this here, I get p squared by 4 minus p squared by 2 plus q equal to 0. In other words, q is <coughs> something or the other. 4q is p squared. This is the equation of the purple curve C because I have eliminated x and you will recognize this as the discriminant being equal to 0. Yeah? <clears throat> I will end with the case of the reduced cubic. Again, <clears throat> if you are interested in yoga, I will request you to stand on your head and look at this equation. Then everything will be absolutely just the way it is supposed to be. This is not a cubic. This is a family of straight lines, one for each value of x. So I will write this as q equals minus px minus x squared, very much like this. The slope is minus x and the q-intercept is minus x cubed. Again draw this family of lines. That's an interesting exercise and again appeal to the artist in you to try and come up with a curve which is tangent to all these lines, precisely one point. <clears throat> this is what you will get. <clears throat> this is what you will get. So if you happen to pick a point here uh, <clears throat> in the PQ plane, you can draw three tangents to this, three tangents. So for this choice of the point P comma Q, your cubic has three distinct real roots. If you happen to pick a point here, say. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. one real root. <coughs> and if you happen to pick a point on the curve C here, <coughs> one. <coughs> so again, uh, if you do this exercise, that means try to find the equation of C. I look at my polynomial and I look at the derivative also equal to 0. These two have to share a root. So if you eliminate x from these two equations, you will get exactly this equation. In other words, I have 4p cubed plus 27q squared equal to 
zero. This is the equation of this curve. This is not differentiable here. Not differentiable here. Okay. Yes, sir. Not visible. Okay. So this is a non-differentiable function. Looks like this, like a semi-cubic parabola. <clears throat> So this is, uh, is one way to understand the, the geometry of these things. Right? This is inherent duality that I'm talking about. So all this can be extended. And it's a very nice uh, theory here. Okay, I think I will stop. Uh, let me not take more of your time. Right? Any questions, anybody? <coughs> it's not the answer. And as a quick demo, I just wanted to say uh, uh, this is very nice. Uh, saying by, uh, so it says that you know if, if people do not believe that mathematics is simple, it is only because they do not believe a complicated life. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.